you've built an empire. You have an incredible business. You have more than 37 years of experience in real estate. You know, I've been in every asset class you can imagine uh, in commercial real estate. So as a company today, we've grown from 100 million in assets just seven years ago to a little over 4.5 billion. Unbelievable growth. I think we're over 500 employees now and, uh, and we're continuing to scale. Hey, Kip, it's good to have you on the show. Hey, Justin, it's, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, this is going to be a lot of fun because uh, we've struck a new friendship here over the last year or two of getting to know one another, getting to know your company and meeting you and your executive team. And um, I'm excited for people to learn more about you and your story and Reef Holdings and all the cool things that you're up to. So welcome. Uh, today's well, going to be a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you have a fantastic story, um, an incredible track record, uh, just a background of all kinds of expertise in the real estate space. But what impressed me more than, you know, just all your accolades is actually how you showed up the first time we met. And uh, you and I got connected through one of our Lifestyle Investor Mastermind members, Darcy Harbit, real good friend. Uh, wonderful guy. And he's like, you got to check these guys out. And then you and your team took a, a, a flight, uh, you know, and, and headed here. I think you guys flew on your own plane. You headed here to meet in person. We got a chance to meet at Soho House and uh, you brought the whole team. You brought I, wonderful I, I, people. I remember that. I think that, you know, anytime you're contemplating doing business with anybody, it's always important to meet face to face, get to know them. I tell all of the reef investors, most important thing you could ever do is know the sponsor, get to know the sponsor. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, that spoke volumes to me that you guys were willing to make a trip down here, and and obviously the goal. You guys have an incredible facility. You know, uh, one of the guys on our team, Hans, dear friend, and does a lot of investments. You know, with me, with us, with Lifestyle Investor. Uh, got a chance to tour your facility, and I know we were trying to find a time for me to get out there, which uh, is is uh, happening this fall, but. Um, it was cool that you guys were, were like, Hey, if you can't make it up here, I'll come down there. You know, I'll make it easy on you. And, uh, just the importance you put on the relationship, uh, and, and meeting, you know, eyeball to eyeball, shaking hands says a lot about you, your character, the team, and really the priority that you give, um, you know, clients and partners. And I was really impressed by that. Well, I appreciate that to, to us. Uh, there's nothing more important. Yeah, you know, you had mentioned something that has just stuck with me because in your business, and we'll get to your story here in a second, but one of the things I thought was really cool, as people move up and they become, you know, the you know the founder, the, the chairman, you know, maybe president before that chairman, um, often they're unreachable. And you had said something when we had first met about how you still take phone calls from clients, uh, even though you're the highest ranking person in your company uh, and and that you leave time and space every day to be able to connect with people as they reach out, that spoke volumes to me as well. Well, I, th I appreciate that. I think that's it. that too is very, very important. I can take it a step further and it's not only, uh, you know, taking, you know, calls from investors or clients or anybody else. It's always being accessible. We, uh, you know, have an open door policy here. There's really not a hierarchy. I've got to wash my dishes after lunch, just like everybody else. If I don't put them in the dishwasher, uh, you know, I get in trouble. And we're not allowed to leave dishes or cups or anything in the sink. You know, we, my office manager even has a camera up there, and somebody will get called out if they happen to do that. I love yeah, it. So I love it. You play by the same rules. I think that's everybody, cool. That's right. Everybody, we, we completely play by the same rules. I make the coffee half the time in the, in the mornings if I'm first in, so... Oh, that's great. Well, here's what I know about you. Uh, you've built an empire. You have an incredible business. You have 37 years, more than 37 years of experience in real estate. So you've got a strong background in real estate brokerage, in mortgage banking, in acquisition, development, asset management, all of it, right? You, you, this is what you've done. But what I'd love to do is go back before you were so accomplished. What did you do? How did you get to where you are? How did you know that you were cut from a different cloth 
that corporate America was not the right place for you? <laughs> I knew at a very, very early age, uh, you know, I was always, uh, I always had this entrepreneurial bent. And uh, I can remember, I guess, the first thing that uh, struck me was uh, my mom you know, would drop me off at my elementary school, Bradfield Elementary, third grade. Uh, and as soon as that old station wagon would turn the corner, there's a 7-Eleven half a block away or right at the next block. And I'd run down to that 7-Eleven and with my 30 cent lunch money would buy 30 pieces of bubble gum and would sell those for a nickel a piece uh, in my during lunch period. And, you know, that kind of started it all. I enjoyed, you know, making money and interacting with people at an early age. We'll say I spent a few Saturdays. Uh, at the school cleaning gum off the bottom of desk once I got kind of in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, as far as real estate goes, I, I graduated from the University of Texas in Austin, uh, where you Love were, in uh, 1985, and uh, was offered an opportunity to work for Lomas and Edelton, the real estate investment banking division in San Antonio. And I'm originally from Dallas, born and raised in Dallas, grew up in Dallas, and uh, really had only been outside of Dallas for the four years I was in Austin and then uh, San Antonio. And then in 87. You were an econ major, right? Yeah. Uh, finance and economics. Okay. Yes, that's right. Um, I uh, uh, a After, you know, two years or so with Lomas and Elton, I'd been you know promoted a couple of times and was uh, offered an opportunity to go set up an office for Lomas Nettleton and their commercial real estate investment banking group. Either I, my choices were uh, Phoenix, Arizona, or Tampa, Florida. And I thought to myself, if they thought that highly of me at 25, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'd uh, go back to Dallas and start my own company, which is what I did do. And in '87, I started a uh, commercial uh, mortgage banking company called Wyndham Group. Um, we basically did everything that I was doing at Lomas and Nettleton and had some big clients that actually followed me. I think my biggest client was equitable real estate at the time. And I was selling, you know, most of their real estate owned assets, but did a lot for, you know, Cigna and uh, the, the various pension fund advisory groups, Aetna, uh, Prudential, and uh, just a great, great business. I'd say, Justin, 50% of it at that time was mortgage originations, doing construction loans, permanent debt, MES debt, a lot of CMBS, uh, subordinate equity, uh, uh, PREF equity, all tranches of the capital stack. And then the other half was uh, you know, investment sales. And what I really liked most about it was the interaction with, you know, the asset managers from the you know various companies and, you know, really drilling down and understanding, you know, real estate, what makes it, you know, tick and putting together, you know, deals. But, you know, the downside to it was it was all a fee business and it was great fees, but I wasn't building anything. I wasn't right. owning the real estate. Right. And so uh, after, you know, I grew Wyndham where we actually opened offices in Austin, San Antonio, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., uh, and, you know, saw, you know, the, the CBREs of the worlds and the Marcus and Millichaps and some of these bigger, you know, these pension funds that I had been doing so much business with were migrating from this boutique type, you know, shop to the big, bigger companies that actually had offices in, you know, you know, 30 states or, you know, much bigger than we were with our five or six offices. So I got together with a couple of like-minded companies. Uh, they were all Pru Express advisors, uh, all very well respected in their individual markets, uh, all kind of boutique operations. And we created a company called ICAP Realty Advisors. And when we everybody came to Dallas to sign the LLC agreements for ICAP Realty Advisors, I think I ended up with 26 offices, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 300 employees and, you know, it was, it was great for a while, but it was making me get out of the transactional side of commercial real estate, which is what I enjoyed so much. I found myself, you know, talking about insurance and, you know, and, and, and managing people, but not really getting into the, what I really enjoyed doing, the structuring of deals. So I rolled out 
and uh, really wanted to focus more on principal transactions. And, you know, that led to where we are today, Reef. And, and real quick, so when you say you rolled out, is this a company that you still hold equity in? Did you get bought out? What what did that look like? I got bought out and okay. uh, did very well on that, you know, buyout. And it was a very amicable, you know, deal. And a lot of uh, ICAP still exists today. It's not the same size it was, uh, you know, back in, uh, you know, 99 to, gosh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, 99 to 2000 is when that all, uh, when, when I when I rolled out. Okay. And had an interim company called Realty America Group with a high school buddy. And that was kind of transitional from pure brokerage to pure principal. And at Realty America Group, about 50% of the business was third party brokerage still. Again, investment sales, mortgage originations. But we started buying, uh, you know, multifamily assets and we did some uh, self storage facilities. We did uh, some smaller retail, just Really, friends, family, country club money. Uh, really enjoyed it quite a bit, and it just everything started uh, building from that experience. Well, you've got a great track record here of starting a company, scaling it to multiple locations, a lot of employees. Um, what happened with that first brokerage company that you grew pretty big? Is that one that you just shut down? Did you sell it? What did that? No, look like? it, it's it's still well. It, for me, it was all an evolution. So Wyndham Group was a, the, the first company that was all brokerage, and it yep. rolled up to ICAP Realty Advisors. Got you. And ICAP Realty Advisors continued, uh, and Realty America Group was a successor to Wyndham Group, okay. focused on still doing some third-party brokerage, but mostly principal transactions. Okay. Reef Holdings I launched with my current partners in 2009 to 2010 to take advantage of what we believed at the time would be RTC2. Okay. That there'd be a lot of uh, distress in the market and a lot of opportunities to, you know, buy uh, deals at deep discounts. And, you know, I quite frankly think that, I, mean, I don't want to get political, but uh, uh, at that time, you know, the, uh, the administration was allowing the uh, banks to maybe extend and pretend a little bit. Mm -hmm. They were not foreclosing and banks weren't being shut down like they were, you know, in the SNL days, or, you know, earlier in the original RTC days. Yep. And but but we really set up Reef Holdings. There was a tagline under Reef Holdings uh, back, you know, when it was first set up and it said real estate note acquisitions. And we went to and met with some 80 to 100 community and regional banks all throughout the South and Southeast. And we had an opportunity to go into their, uh, you know, look at their performing loans or non-performing loans or sub-performing loans, their REO. And we would do mark-to-market valuations. We'd spend maybe a week at the bank and we'd look at their assets. We'd look at their you know, portfolios, and I'd be sitting across from the president of the bank, and I had my mark-to-market valuations, and they had where the uh, FDIC was requiring them to write down the loans, which wasn't much. There was still a big gap, and, you know, they'd say, you know, hey, Kip, I agree with your valuations. FDIC is not forcing us to take these, you know, mark-to-market write-downs, uh, and if we did, you know, our tier one capital ratio at 2% today would you know, be lower and they'd have to come in and shut us down. So it was a good call. And, you know, uh, real estate values started, you know, lifting back up and uh, the phone started ringing. And a lot of the relationships that we made from those days uh, transcended, transcended to, you know, give Reef a good start on acquiring real estate. Yeah, that's great. And it's also a fascinating thing where these numbers can be massaged, the accounting, like, all, you know, it's what should happen or what could happen. It's almost like we can, you know, there's ways to manufacture delay. There's ways to manufacture, you know, <laughs> the, the reporting and how things show up and what things look like and how much time do we need to buy. So it's it's a fascinating world when you really get into the weeds, right? I agree 100 percent. It is. It is. And, and for sometimes it's the better. But I mean, in some instances, it's for the worse. Right. I mean, it's it sometimes can prop up. um you know, banks or companies that really were irresponsible in the way that they managed, in the way that they lent money, in the way that they structured their business dealings. I agree with that. 
But I will say, I think that you saw less, you know, turnover and less distress in the market, you know, from, you know, 2010, those days than you did, obviously, in the RTC days. Yeah. Um, you know, you didn't, the banks didn't lose as much uh, by, you know, extending and, and, and going through these workouts. And eventually, uh, were able to dispose of their real estate, you know, owned assets and live another day. Yeah. Um, and it was great for us because we bought quite a bit. Well, we have really enjoyed learning about kind of how Reef Holdings has emerged. And I want to dive into that a little more. Before we get there, uh, one of the things that I thought uh, was really good, and by the way, we had you guys at our recent Lifestyle Investor uh, event. You know, we had a live event. We had a vetting deals course that we recorded uh, that's going to be live soon uh, once production is complete. Uh, so that was day one. And then day two was a live event. And you guys were guests and really got a chance to to teach and share a lot on multifamily with our community, with our members. And we opened it up to a handful of non-members that um, we had interviewed and felt like we're a good fit. And uh, your team, you know, you guys just did a great job. Uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, that I would love for you to elaborate on, because you hinted at it already, are the different tranches of capital. You know, when you when you look at the capital stack or uh, or the cap table, it's like there's there's these different tranches or different tiers of priority or seniority. And I think it'd be fun to kind of run through these. I think, you know, some of our listeners probably are very aware of this, but plenty of them are not. And I think it's important, you know, when when you're investing to kind of know where you are in that capital stack. Are you senior secured? Are you at the top of this capital stack? Are you junior? Are you mes debt? Are you pref equity? Are you common equity? So if you wanted to give a run through of that, I think that would be pretty helpful to our audience. Yeah, and I think to uh, answer that, it's going to be a little longer answer because you've really got to understand, you know, Reef and where we've come from and where we play uh, in commercial real estate. And, you know, uh, you know, our focus today, we, we've got, as you know, I think five main verticals or five platforms. And they're, uh, it, it's important to understand those five as I get into, you know, the way we structure our capital stack, because each is a little bit different. Um, you know, multifamily remains our, our largest uh, vertical, our largest division. Within that group, you know, we are buying existing multifamily assets throughout the south, southeastern part of the United States. Uh, very, very nice assets, garden style, you know, two, three story, uh, you know, primarily stick built, some wrap, but primarily stick built. And we're really catering to middle America. I mean, it's the largest population base in the country. And all five of our verticals or the other four have a similar type uh, concept, really catering to middle America uh, for all things residential and leisure, you know, and vacation. Drive to leisure is a big, big theme with us. Uh, and, you know, that comes from, you know, being in the business, as you pointed out, 37, now 38 years. I guess that ages me <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. But, um, uh, you know, from, you know, I've been in every asset class you can imagine uh, in commercial real estate. And really at this stage in life and where I really see the most value and the most recession resiliency is in the verticals that we uh, participate. And it is that, uh, you know, residential and, and drive to leisure in the south, southeastern part of the United States, high growth areas, uh, you know, business friendly climate. Uh, we're seeing more and more, you know, migration from the West Coast and the Northeast down to, you know, our markets. Our biggest markets are Texas, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, but very active in Arkansas and, and uh, you know, Oklahoma and, you know, some in Virginia. And anyway, that's uh, brief. And we are, we do not have yet and, and uh, have avoided uh, putting together funds. All of our Capital really comes from our retail investor base. Uh, we've been blessed in that uh, we've been able to grow and scale to the size that we have today with our retail investor base and without having to bring in, you know, big institutional capital partners uh, as common equity or control over, you know, the, our, our overall direction. Uh, so today it's multifamily. We have a beachfront hospitality and resort platform which is buying existing hotels in iconic locations on beaches. 
Uh, that program actually has a very heavy capital improvement component to it. In some cases, we'll go in uh, and take the facility back to its concrete frame and completely rebuild it. Uh, and then heavy emphasis on the amenities. We will we'll build lazy rivers, resort pools, family entertainment centers, uh, you know, restaurants, um, you know, uh, lots of, uh, you know, palm trees and just really elevating the overall experience of the guests. Then we have reef communities. Reef communities is building cities. I mean, literally building cities. We'll take down large tracts of land in close proximity to major MSAs. We bought 3,300 3, acres just south of where I'm sitting right now with 50% uh, in Waxahachie, 50% in uh, Midlothian. There, we've designed 8,500 you know, single family for sale uh, lots that will sell to the home builders like the DR Hortons, the Lenars, the Pultes, the Meritage, the Highland Homes, you know, the national and regional builders. We ourselves, uh, Justin, as a company, will do roughly between 2,500 and 3,000 rentals, single family rental, built BTR communities, multi multifamily communities, townhome projects, detached and attached. Uh, we're putting in a town center. We're putting in a beach, hiking, biking trails, uh, um, soccer fields, two schools. No, actually, Midlothian has three schools going in. We, we build out and put in the our own wastewater treatment facility. We're our own taxing authority, police and fire. So we're building cities. Uh, not too far from where you live, we're doing another one, coincidentally, uh, about the same size. It's uh, 3,276 acres, same deal. Single family, multifamily rental, uh, single family for sale, town center, commercial, uh, schools, all the roads, the infrastructure, the wastewater treatment facility, all the utilities. Only difference there is that we've got about 600 acres that's planned for life sciences, tech, industrial. You know, it's Caldwell County, and you know that California's moving there, right? That's right. That's right. And so, it's just a great, great location. Yeah. yeah, great location. And so, what we really look for, uh, you know, Reef Communities is also doing some smaller projects. These are those are multi-billion-dollar projects. Some smaller ones would be where we'll build anywhere from 150, uh, 149 uh, uh, BTR project, uh, build to rent, build to uh, rent. project. Yeah. We're doing one in Royce City. I think you guys uh, have, some of your investors have invested in it. It's called Capstone. Yep. We'll have another one of those uh, uh, back in Waxahachie, which is near that other community that we're doing there. But things like that. It's just really catering to middle America, very nice, communities, highly amenitized communities uh, that average people can afford. Uh, then we've got a fourth vertical that is our extended stay hospitality. That particular vertical is not geographically constrained. We'll, we'll build anywhere in the country where it makes sense to and love that program in so much as, uh, you know, it's a, one of the most resilient uh, categories within the hospitality, you know, space. And we learned that throughout COVID and it continues to be the darling of, you know, institutional capital. And we can build these extended stay hospitality prop projects in, you know, 12 months. They ramp very, very quickly. Uh, we're doing a few under uh, the choice brand, Wood Springs uh, Suites, uh, Everhome Suites, but we're really focusing going forward on the extended stay premiere, and we're going to start blowing up and blowing out and doing quite a few of these new Hyatt Studios, and then we'll do some of the Marriott and the uh, Hilton project. But as a company, Justin, and I think you know this, scale matters, and everything that we do is all about scale. That's right. In fact, we won't look to exit our extended stay, you know, portfolio until we have well over a billion with, you know, 30 or 40 of these different branded assets located in different strong markets that will sell to whatever REITs can overpay us at the time, be it Blackstone, Starwood, you know, Apollo, or the countless others that, you know, can't get enough out. We like scale because the institutional capital that can, you know, stroke, 
and you pay more, you buy lower cap rates, but the cost of funds need to write, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 million dollar checks. And they can't just write, you know, 10, 20, 30 million dollar checks. And so for us, everything is about, you know, scale, multifamily, beachfront hospitality resorts, uh, the reef communities, uh, the uh, extended stay vertical. And lastly, and our newest vertical we launched in 2023 with the acquisition of five RV parks. And typical of Reef, we're not just you know doing what everybody else is doing in that space. We created, I think, a new category within that you know overall RV uh, space of real estate that um, you know involves taking our hospitality expertise and kind of con- combining that with an RV type community, but for us, they're, um, they're horizontal resorts, and we're putting in the Lazy River, we're putting in the uh, resort pools, we're putting in the family entertainment centers, we're putting in the restaurants, and most importantly, we're, you know, at least anywhere from 10 to up to even 50% of the pads, we're going to put these tiny homes, these drop houses in there, so people that are not, don't own RVs can enjoy the you know, horizontal, you know, type resort. So as a company today, we've grown from 100 million in assets just seven years ago to a little over 4.5 billion. So it's just been unbelievable growth. We've got a little over, uh, I think we're over 500 employees now. Wow. Uh, And uh, and we're continuing to scale. This, we explained a little bit about Reef, but didn't specifically answer your question about capital stack and where where we play. So, everything that we do in Reef, uh, where our investors are coming in, the common uh, equity piece. They're the owners of the real estate, and um, we're not we we we're not we don't do debt. We're, we're not debt funds. Uh, we do have a debt fund, but it's different from a traditional debt fund. We use it. Uh, and allow our retail investors to participate with Reef when we're making temporary sponsor loans to the different LLCs. And uh, it's a great program. And I think quite a few of your investors have most have recently jumped in, you know, that space for us. Yeah, you've, but, you've but, offered a bunch of programs and, and optionality exclusive to lifestyle investor we, members, we, which we appreciate. We did. Yeah, we did, and that uh, we've just enjoyed getting to know you guys. Such a great group, uh, and it's been a you know it's been a great experience for us. But the the the, the deal with the uh, debt fund is you you're, you're making twelve percent. Yeah, you know that's it. You're making twelve percent. Now, now that's great. That's great. But you know your our expectations with you know coming into uh, you know our different equity you know investments through our different verticals. You know, your expectation should be, you know, closer to 20, 22 kind of percent internal rate of returns and, you know, a multiple, a, a uh, you know, anywhere from a 175 to a 20 multiple on your equity given a, you know, three, three and a half year hold. And that's pretty much the way we underwrite all of our deals for our equity investors. Yeah, and you guys have a really neat program where if someone is using one of your debt products, which I know you don't do that very often, but... Um, you guys are, you know, when you do it, it's very secure in the capital stack. There's it a is. lot of collateral behind it. And so plenty, plenty of room that if anything were to go wrong, these investors would be made whole. But one of the cool things that you do, even though you have like a term on this, uh, so it's not, you know, it's not like you can just redeem, you know, next day or a week or a month, you've got a term, but for anyone that finds a deal on the equity side that they're interested, they can roll that in immediately. They don't have to honor that term on, on the, that, the debt fund. That, that's right. In fact, we have quite a few investors that while they're waiting for their next reef deal, they just put money in the debt fund because they're earning 12% on it as they you know figure out what their next reef deal is going to be. And I also will point out that you know even without investing in any of the you know reef deals, we have uh, four times a year redemption. So, you know, it is fairly liquid, particularly if you're yielding, you know, 12, 12%. So it's uh, been a very attractive, uh, you know, deal. And like you said before, we haven't really opened it. It's not on our portal. We haven't opened it up to, uh, you know, many 
of the reef and investors. We're, we may start to do that, but you know we're going to be careful. And uh, you know, last thing we want to do is have a bunch of you know capital sitting in the bank that we're paying twelve percent on and not being able to you know uh, lend it out to our different uh, you know uh, assets. Yeah, and you guys do. Uh, this is a unique program. Again, not on your portal, so. You've got to be kind of on the inside, be, you know, be, be, be a life lifestyle yeah. investor. You get access. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you did this really fun 1010 deal. And I, you right. know, I, I've never seen it structured like that. I'd love for you to explain that because I, I thought this is a, a very unique product. Yeah. So in our reef communities, uh, there are a lot of different times at which investors can get in. And, you know, reef communities will just take down land that, you know, is agricultural and not yet been developed, and we've got to go in and completely entitle a, you know, property, and it takes time. I mean, and it's, you know, it's, you know, getting a mud, a municipal utility district put in place, and we can bring utilities to it, and entitling that a master plan community and designing it, and that could be anywhere from a, you know, two, three, five-year period to get it to that point. And, uh, you know, we uh, you know, do create a tremendous amount of value along the way uh, and different times in which we can exit if we chose not to fully develop it ourselves, you know, put the entitlements in place, get the municipal utility district in place, maybe do a PID or TERS. And we do offer uh, equity investors an opportunity to come in at the early stage of this process and really act more as a lender than having a an equity position in the overall waterfall. And that is a program we came up with that we call 1010. And what it does is it pays a 10% current with a 10%, you know, accrued. And, uh, you know, that's it. It's just like, uh, you know, it's just like the debt fund gets 12%. This theoretic, I mean, this gets 20%. And it, too, is a very, very uh, secure spot in the capital stack, never typically getting above a 50 percent of the current market value for that asset. Uh, and it really just depends on, you know, what the overall business plan is for a particular project and what the timeline is for that project. Yeah. And what's interesting about that strategy, I really like this because your goal here, you buy this land. And you actually want to develop it. You want to see it all the way through to the end. But you test the waters and you say, hey, what will someone give me, you know, mid project? We'll entitle this. Let's just see if we can get an offer that is too good to pass up. Because, you know, if you can get that, you might as well sell it, make some great money, get, you know, make some investors happy and then, you know, take that return and move on to the next project. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty fun to have that. I always tell people I love having the optionality of more than one exit strategy because uh, it, it de-risks a deal. It can create some extra upside. Often it can be done in a much shorter window than a full development project. And, and in many instances, you might be getting, uh, and in certain markets, you might get the return or close to the return you would have gotten waiting twice as long to actually develop it out. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, it depends on where you are in the cycle 100%. You know, I think that, you know, in our you know reef communities, we're going to always focus on the high growth areas. And so, uh, and, you know, the close proximity to the major MSAs, i.e., you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio. Um, and, you know, we, uh, you know, where there's tremendous demand for a particular asset class or project. So we do have a high degree of comfort that we're going to, you know, if we entitle this saying, we're going to have multiple groups wanting to buy it from us. And, you know, you're right. We could sell it all. We could sell little uh, pads or pods, you know, to, to different uh, builders de-risk, end up not having, you know, having negative basis in the balance of the dirt, getting our cake and eating it too, and developing it out. Now, it's funny you brought this up. One of those two projects at uh, the 1010, uh, you know, we've gotten recently some very, very big number, you know, numbers on it. And uh, we're, we're scratching our heads, you know, we may <laughs> go ahead and exit the whole thing. I mean, we'll walk away, I'll tell you, with, you know, a, a, a big profit. And, uh, you know, but then you've got to think, okay, well, I've got this 
pile of cash now. Am I going to be able to, to, to deploy it? And, you know, you've got to feel comfortable and confident that you can. Right now, I feel like we can. Uh, we're seeing quite a few, you know, opportunities. I don't want to, you know, say that they're distressed opportunities. We think that there are, you know, certain sponsors that are feeling some pain with the way they structured oh, yeah. their capital stack, no quite doubt. different than the way we structure our capital stack. As you know, uh, you know, our multifamily uh, program, everything that we do in it, we, we put long-term fixed rate agency debt, either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Yep. Um, we're select sponsors, uh, Optigo sponsors, uh, which is a big, you know, we take great pride in that. I mean, it's a big honor, you know, with you know, Freddie Mac to have that, you know, relationship with them. And uh, it certainly, you know, helps us in our uh, underwriting and our comfort level, if you will. Yeah. And just for some background for those of you uh, that may not understand what's happening in, in the real estate space, especially in multifamily, but other other real estate asset classes as well, you've got a lot of these sponsors that uh, use bridge lending and and floating rates, which means that when these rates kept adjusting, um, that people had deals that they that they basically ran the numbers on at, at one um you know pro forma that should work but maybe didn't stress test it well enough or didn't recognize that the rates could go up they don't you know they didn't they didn't buy a cap they didn't do you know they didn't secure long term financing even when they could have and it was a frothy environment they got a little too greedy and now they're in trouble the deal doesn't pencil uh, they're losing money. They're doing extra capital calls from their investors. And even in some cases, that's not enough. It's just a Band-Aid. And so I always say, and I like that you guys agree with this, whenever you can secure low rate, long term fixed debt uh, to do your deals, that's the best move that you can do. And with agency, you generally get the best terms. Um, you know, Fannie Mae, usually smaller amounts, Freddie Mac, uh, larger amounts. But uh, both are great vehicles to use, and just so many sponsors in this last decade got comfortable with being able to, you know, have these quick flips, be able to do it inside of, you know, two, three, four, five years. Till they got caught. That's right. That's right. And, and I tell people all the time, like, I, I missed out on a lot of those deals because they, even though they worked out and people made money on them, they were still too risky for me. Whereas, you know, the deals that I did, maybe I missed deals, but I'm in all the deals that have the long term debt now. So in this market, I don't have that risk profile that a lot of my friends have that worked. I mean, it did work until it didn't. Right. You're 100 percent spot on. Everything you said is exactly correct and exactly what happened. So, you know, as a company, you know, we don't want to take the risk. We're not going to bet on the comp. We're underwriting, you know, based on today's economics. And uh, if we're comfortable with that, wherever interest rates are, we're going to fix it because we're going to sleep better at night. And we also know that we're going to still create that, you know, value. And, you know, we also do don't do a lot of one offs anymore. I mean, most of what we do are going to be big portfolio trades. And uh, in fact, the last three multifamily deals we've done have all been over 500 million, you know, with multiple sellers, multiple assets and, you know, uh, TC21, by way of example, 21 assets we bought. I think it was three or four different sellers. We locked in, this was December of 21. We locked in 10 years fixed rate money at 2.71%. Wow. It was six years of IO. So oh, let's think about that for a minute. That's Cap beautiful. rates are up, right, today. Yep. They should be in that, you know, 5.5%, maybe even 6%, given where interest rates are. That's where they should be. That's where markets should be today to transact. Um, when we are locked in at 2.71% with assumable debt, my cap rate is going to be 300 basis points less than where market is, which brings me back to, you know, uh, where cap rates were before interest rates went up, meaning that my existing portfolio is worth more uh, than you know any other portfolio that's out there. If I were to go, you know, sell it today, a year later uh, we did another. We called it uh, well, it was HPX. We bought ten assets. The X meaning ten. It's since been named uh, Southeast Portfolio Three, but ten assets. We locked in 
four hundred million uh, or so. Uh, again, Freddie, ten year fixed rate at four point three seven percent. Higher That's interest right. rate, but still great interest rate. That's still right. in the money. Uh, portfolio we did just last year. Now, little different in that. You know, we thought rates are kind of high, but we're not going to take the floating rate gamble. In our analysis, we think rates will start coming back down. So what do we do? Because we're select Optigo sponsors with Freddie, you know, they listened to us and we said, look, guys, we need better. We need five year product. We want to lock in for five years, not 10 years, but five years. That'll give us the comfort we want. And, the, you know, rates, if they come back down, we're not going to have this huge defeasance once we have executed on our business plan. And, you know, if it takes three years and I want to sell, you know, I've just got two years left of a little bit higher rates, perhaps. But we locked in at 5.2 percent. Still a great rate. And I sleep well at night knowing where the majority of your expenses are and debt service are, are locked. But what happened, and you're right, is a lot of people that, you know, haven't been through multiple real estate cycles and, and, and sponsors that see all the money that's being made in multifamily. I've got friends that, that can invest with me and I can get out there and I can do what Reef is doing. And, and, and uh, But what, the, the, you know, that they, they, they got high leverage from, like you said, the bridge lenders that are floating rate, and they can't, every single dime that comes off of that asset is going to try to service that debt. That's right. A lot of times they can't uh, afford to buy the rate caps going forward. Lenders are requiring rate caps. Uh, but what really happens is that the assets eventually will become distressed because no money is being put back into the asset to maintain it, and even worse, uh, some of these sponsors are not qualifying tenants. They're putting tenants in property just to hope that they pay for 30 days or 60 days. So now when we're looking at these type portfolios, we're spending three, four, five times longer doing lease audits and because we realize that, you know, we can't rely on the, you know, the rent rolls that are presented. And I think there's a certain percentage of the tenants that we're going to have to, sadly, you know, evict, and then we're going to have to redo that unit and then release it so there's a lot of that going on today um yeah it's uh i mean i'm glad that you speak on it and i'm glad that you guys have a plan and i mean it's going to create great opportunities for those of us on the sidelines that are you know are willing to take uh willing to be patient wait for some of this distressed um you know debt distressed assets to, to come online and we're already starting to see them i mean i just recently Absolutely. did a deal in austin that's like I mean, it's it's amazing what we ended up getting. I mean, this is a a trophy asset, uh, and they were in financial ruin, and we were able to come in and and not only did we move into uh, you know the top of the capital stack, but uh, the collateral that we got is another trophy asset. <laughs> so, yeah. prime location. I mean, it's it's really incredible what's happening, and and I don't think most people are seeing it yet. Yeah, we're starting to see it. We've got about three hundred eighty million. Uh, you know, in the pipeline of that that exact product. Yeah. Now, I will say, you know, and it's 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 very sad, and that is that, you know, of that 380 million, most of what we're underwriting is coming in right at debt, in some cases below debt. So, what does that mean? That means that LP equity is getting wiped it's out. Getting wiped out. Completely yeah, and gone. I just, you know, I hate that, uh, but you know. Yeah, we're seeing it a lot. Seeing a lot of these sponsors that literally, I mean, they're they're losing it all. They're foreclosing yeah. and. Um, all equity holders are, are, are gone. We try to figure out ways in those circumstances to, you know, at least salvage something, you know, for those, for, for those LP yeah. folks to the extent we can, but I That's mean, right. you know, we're, we're still going to underwrite, you know, it's mark to market and this is what it is. And we're also actually getting some calls from, you know, lenders, you know, early on, uh, you know, just, you know, asking our opinions and would we consider taking over, management or perhaps even stepping in. I think you probably know this, but we're a completely vertically integrated company. I mean, we have in-house property management, uh, was Reef Residential, rebranded now to RR Living because not only do they manage our 15,000 units, but they're managing another 5,000 units for our competitors or third parties. Uh, so RR Living is what we rebranded to, and they're very, very good. They know how to not only manage the revenue side of the P&L, but also the expense side. 
which is what we look for because that translates into yield to our equity investors. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And uh, I know we're running low on time, but I have to mention that one of the things I'm most impressed with, I think you guys are world class in, in just virtually every category, but the one that is such an outlier that is so unique that you don't see um, in your space to the level that you have it is your software. You guys have built proprietary software that allows you at a glance, at a moment, to look at any single unit anywhere uh, across the U.S. in real time and know what's going on uh, to, the, to the point that you've been asked by several institutions if they will white label your software to them uh, yes. to use. That's Which, very true. Of That's course, very, you're not going to do true. it. But uh, I mean, talk yeah. talk a little bit about that. And and when we had Doug and uh, and Jeff come and and you know present some of the software and some of the cool things you're doing, that was one of the things I raved about to the lifestyle investor community because uh, it's you guys are outliers in this. You guys are are head and shoulders ahead of every other sponsor I've looked at in in the world of of building out your own proprietary software with the functionality that you have. Yeah, I appreciate that. It means a lot. You know, we're a very, you know, data-driven company. I think a lot of companies say they're data-driven, but they're really not. We are. And we rely heavily. Data does not lie. Now, you got to know how to interpret that data. You've got to know how to understand that data. But with where, you know, technology is today, there's probably not one asset management or property management software off the shelf that we haven't, you know, had people pitch to us or come in. And there's lots of good ones. And we like certain aspects of some and certain aspects of the other. And finally, we said, you know, look, if we could take this, 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 and and, and put it into a, you know, package that really fits what Reef is all about, that would be great. And we figured out you can't. So we hired full-time software engineers, brilliant people, to come in. And over the course of, you know, two, three, four years, and it's continually evolved, we've created some incredible uh, you know, dashboards that do allow us to, you know, know what's going on at any given time at any of our properties. Uh, you know, the computer is pulling data from hundreds of different, you know, sources while we sleep at night. And when I get up, you know, in the morning, uh, I can, you know, log in and, and know exactly what our portfolio did the night before, particularly on the hospitality side. I mean, it'll, you know, show us what, uh, you know, every room that was, you know, read it, what the ADR was, the occupancy, the rent or the food and beverage. On the multifamily side, you know, it's got lots of different KPIs, uh, you know, built into it. And if one of these KPIs gets tripped or the computer doesn't like one of these KPIs, it'll send a text message, you know, to the asset manager and to the head of the department so that that asset manager, when he shows up the next morning, you know, knows to log in to figure out what tripped that KPI. So it really does help us, you know, stay ahead of it. And, mm. uh, you know, it's got algorithms built into it that, you know, is, is constantly looking at where interest rates are or, you know, in certain markets where, uh, you know, new products coming into and where occupancies are. And it's given us heads up to, uh, you know, focus on things before they become a problem. Yeah, that, that's yeah. brilliant. I mean, to, to, like, I, I'm a huge data driven guy, and I, I make a lot of my investment decisions based on this data that, that, you know, I need to, I need to have access to. And when companies can't provide it, then it's just a no. But what I love is like, you can set up the, you know, the, these, um, you know, triggers, these uh, automations, and it, and this could even be on the asset management side of things. It's like, hey, you're, you know, this this loan is is coming due in two years. Start working on, you know, the the next layer, the next funding round, whatever that needs to look like. It and so it's not just occupancy. I mean, of course, you can get the occupancy where it's like, hey, uh, we're we're seven percent below where we should be this this weekend, uh, this exact weekend last year, this holiday weekend, or hey you know, we need to celebrate this one's way up, you know, food, beverage, you know, whatever. And you can see it all in real time. I just love it. Um, you know, you're right on the uh, on the uh, interest rates. I mean, the computer tells us what deals to specifically look at to refinance. Yep. You know, it, it's calculating what the defeasance is given a certain interest rates. It's looking at our debt coverage ratio. So if our debt coverage ratios are at, you know, 2.5 or 3.0, it's saying, you know what, guys, you can pull a lot of capital out. And I bet you the debt's going to be cheaper. You yep. can return capital to your equity investors. Yep. And the computer's telling us all this. 
Kip, yeah. it's incredible what you've built. Um, I've had so much fun catching up here. Uh, why don't you tell us where we can find out more about you and Reef Holdings? Yeah, go go to uh, www.reef, R-R-E-A-F dot com. Uh, you can log in, sign up as an investor. You don't have to put any money in or anything else. But, you know, if you're once you're an accredited investor, you'll see all of our deals. You can also uh, go to YouTube, type in Reef Academy. We probably have 30, 40 hours of lectures that we do just in our conference room with different department heads, you know, talking about real estate. Um, you know, I didn't even have a chance to get into our uh, operational uh, operations manual, which I think really drives a lot of, you know, how Reef has grown as big as it's grown. And we still, you know, pay a lot of attention to detail. Yeah, you guys have really built out some world-class education, operation manual. I mean, really just you have a playbook for every single thing you do in, in the event that you need to transition people in the company. It's it's a lot smoother of a transition because uh, it, it is very systematized throughout. So, and, you know, we didn't have time to dig into, you know, the fact that you're a family man, a man of faith, just, you know, that you have so many things that you prioritize in the right way. You've been very successful on a business front, but... Um, you know, you, you have rich relationships, you you prioritize people and, and family and faith over business. And so uh, a lot a lot to love about you and what you're up to. So thanks for spending the time with us here today, Kip. This has been an awesome session. Justin, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I, I hope I get a, or have an opportunity to come back and talk more. It's been it's been a lot of fun. It sure has. Well, I love ending every episode asking our audience one question, a simple question, an easy question. Uh, and, and it's this, what's one step you can take today towards financial freedom to move in that direction, even if it's just a little bit, but to move towards a life that you truly desire, a life that's on your terms. Most people live life on default. So how can you take one step closer to living life by design and, and, and achieving financial freedom? Thanks so much. And we'll catch you next week. Thank you.